Panasonic recently released their LX100 compact fixed lens camera. This camera offers a sensor that is slightly smaller than four thirds of an inch and has a very fast f1.7 to f2.8 24 to 75 millimeter lens. This video will attempt to show you how to get the most out of this extraordinary new camera. Please remember to rate this video and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like it. The LX100 is a relatively small camera. It won't fit in pants pockets, but it will fit in a jacket pocket or a very small camera bag. Part of the reason it is so small is that the flash is detachable. Some people have an issue with this because they think all compact cameras must have a built-in flash to be useful in low light. In this case, the LX100 has a bright enough lens and a big enough sensor that you should rarely need a flash. Instead of thinking of this as a camera that does not have a built-in flash, I like to think of it as a camera that has a removable flash to make it much smaller when the flash is not necessary. I keep my flash and two extra batteries with the camera in the small camera bag. The LX100 has a very unique layout for its controls. Instead of having the typical PASM modes, it simply has a shutter speed dial and an aperture ring on the front of the camera. Both of these dials have an auto mode as well as fixed aperture and shutter speed settings. If you set both rings to A, then the camera will act like the old program priority mode. If you set the shutter speed to A and adjust the aperture ring, it will act like the aperture priority mode. If you adjust shutter speed while it is in A for aperture, then it will act like the old shutter priority mode. Finally, if you adjust both aperture and shutter speed, it will be in full manual mode. What is really nice is that all of those modes, including full manual, can use auto ISO. That gives you the flexibility to configure the aperture and shutter speed exactly how you want them and still have the camera figure out what the appropriate ISO value should be for perfect exposure. The only mode that it lacks is full manual mode with auto ISO and exposure compensation control. I realize that there are a lot of people out there that choose to use the camera in this fashion the majority of the time. For them, being able to explicitly select shutter speed, aperture, and exposure compensation and then have the camera float the ISO is a big deal. If you shoot in this manner and you are unwilling to try any other methods, you probably shouldn't buy the LX100. Panasonic has never allowed that technique on any of their cameras and they are unlikely to add it to this camera. However, if you are willing to try other methods to achieve the same end result, I can show you what is possible. Although, I will say that it would be very nice if Panasonic just added this functionality so we wouldn't have to discuss these workarounds at all. First, I simply recommend shooting in program priority mode with auto ISO and exposure compensation control. Contrary to what most reviews have said, the LX100 actually has excellent auto ISO logic. It will try to select the optimal aperture for detail if there is enough light. However, in low light, it will allow very slow shutter speed since the image stabilization is so good in this camera. I know some professional photographers always avoid program priority mode with auto ISO because it takes away some of the control from them. In the past, program priority was looked at as a bad choice because the camera would select something different from what the user wanted and the controls to correct that were limited. With the LX100, everything has changed. The new shutter speed, aperture, and exposure compensation dials give you quick and direct access to change the settings if you think it should be different from what the camera has selected automatically. You also have the program shift functionality that allows you to change shutter speed and aperture together in order to give priority to either setting. Please note that you cannot use program shift if the intelligent ISO function is enabled. Only the auto ISO and manually selected ISO parameters allow program shift. If you manually select a specific shutter speed, the camera will automatically switch from intelligent ISO to auto ISO. So when should you use intelligent ISO then? You should only use intelligent ISO when you know the light levels are so low that you will want to use the aperture wide open regardless of the focal length. If you are in a poorly lit environment shooting moving subjects, then the intelligent ISO will select a faster shutter speed, up to 1 1 20th of a second, if it detects movement. It is much more sensitive to movement than the intelligent ISO function in my GH4, which is a good thing. 
The really nice thing is that if it doesn't sense any motion in the subject, it will select a slower shutter speed and also a lower ISO for better noise control. It gives you the ability to optimize the shutter speed and ISO values depending on subject movement. The GH4 I have is useless in program priority mode with intelligent ISO because it will never let the ISO go over ISO 3200 in that mode. The GH4 is capable of going much higher than that with acceptable results. Thankfully, the LX100 will go all the way to ISO 12800 in this mode when it senses subject movement. The camera has great image stabilization to deal with camera movement. However, image stabilization won't help at all for subject movement. Only a faster shutter speed will help with that. For movements like a head turn or a child playing, the 1 1 20th of a second in intelligent ISO mode is usually acceptable. However, for faster movement, you can easily switch to a specific shutter speed. I typically adjust to 1 400th of a second, and then I can go up or down from there with the easy to access thumb dial on the back of the camera. With those shutter speeds, I can freeze just about any motion I want to. However, it would be really nice if Panasonic hadn't removed the minimum shutter speed settings for auto ISO that the old LX7 had. It really was a mistake to take that feature out. It makes it much easier to tailor the auto ISO logic to fit your specific needs. Add this to the list of things Panasonic really needs to add via firmware update. With program priority mode, you can also select positive or negative exposure bias with the control dial on the top right of the camera. This function allows you to protect against clipping highlights if the dynamic range of the scene exceeds the dynamic range of the camera's sensor. In this picture, negative exposure compensation can be dialed in to protect against the blown highlights in the mirror's reflection. However, the underexposure in the shadow detail would need to be corrected in post-processing as well. The extra dynamic range offered by the LX100's larger sensor usually prevents the need to use this dial excessively. However, if you do run into situations like this, it is nice to know that it is there. Trying to select negative exposure in full manual mode is very difficult to do. You cannot see the exposure meter when you select an ISO, and the histogram disappears as well. Simply allowing us to adjust the exposure compensation in manual mode with auto ISO would alleviate all of these issues. Hopefully Panasonic will realize that one day and add this feature via firmware update. If you feel you need more control than the program shift and priority program mode can provide, then selecting a specific aperture or a specific shutter speed can help. I would still leave it in auto ISO mode though. Trying to manually select your ISO is very cumbersome, even if you assign it to the front lens dial ring. The camera will do a good job selecting an appropriate ISO for the shutter speed or aperture you have selected. If you feel the need to adjust both at the same time, you can still use auto ISO, but remember you will lose the ability to adjust the exposure compensation. I tested the lens at various focal lengths and aperture values. At 24mm, the lens has its optimal sharpness at f5.6. The sharpness on center is pretty good for just about any aperture. However, the corners are pretty fuzzy wide open at this focal length. As you get above f8.0, the entire image will start to lose some detail due to diffraction. Personally, I would never use f16 with the LX100 unless there was excessive light, like when you are looking into the sun, or if you need to slow the shutter speed down to a very slow speed. This might occur if you are trying to blur fast moving water. In both of those cases, detail isn't your priority, so f16 might work. However, for most other situations, stopping down past f8.0 with the LX100 is just going to reduce the detail in your images and videos. The camera will always try to get to f5.6 in auto modes if there is enough light. It has been programmed for the optimal detail across the focal range. A lot of people still think that they should try to stop this camera down past f8.0 if they want deep depth of field. They usually shoot wide angle landscape pictures with f16 because they are afraid the foreground will be blurry if they don't. That is a technique that is very appropriate for larger full frame sensors, but not a good idea for relatively small sensor cameras like the LX100. I went ahead and calculated what the hyperfocal distance is for the focal lengths across the LX100's entire focal range. At the camera's widest angle of 24 millimeters, the hyperfocal distance is only 17 feet, even at f1.7. 
What this means is that if the camera is focused on a subject at 17 feet, then everything behind the subject will be in focus, and everything 8.5 feet or less in front of the subject will be in focus as well. If you are standing up with the camera, it is likely that the entire field of view will be in focus, no matter what aperture you select for this focal length. If you want to be extra safe, then selecting f5.6 for optimal detail will move the hyperfocal distance to only 5 feet at 24 millimeters. That will mean that everything that is 2.5 feet away from the camera and further will be in focus. There really isn't a reason to use greater than f5.6 at this focal length unless you are doing macro work. What would really be cool is if Panasonic allowed you to make one of the customizable function buttons a hyperfocal button. If you press that button, the camera could automatically set the lens to the hyperfocal distance. That way you would be able to quickly set the camera to its maximum depth of field, no matter what the aperture and focal length are. You can already make the function buttons do a one-time back button focus. It would be nice to also be able to make this a one-time hyperfocal button. The function buttons are a bit easier to use for one-time focus than the shutter button is. Stopping down after 35mm might be beneficial if you want deep depth of field. However, I still think you should keep it to f8.0 or less because it hurts detail if the aperture gets any higher than that. At 52mm and f8.0, you will still have a hyperfocal distance of right at 16 feet. That is the same reasonably deep depth of field it has at 24mm with a wide open aperture of f1.7. Again, if you really want the optimal detail, then program priority mode with auto ISO will always give you that in good light. It is really nice to finally be able to put a camera in full auto mode for landscape pictures and know that you are getting the optimal results. As you zoom in, depth of field does get shallower and shallower. By 35 millimeters, the hyperfocal distance is up to over 26 feet and the minimum aperture is at f2.3. By the time you reach 52 millimeters, the hyperfocal distance is over 46 feet with an f2.8 minimum aperture. All of the Panasonic Micro Four Thirds cameras will stop down way too much with auto ISO and program priority mode. That is why I never used it before I got the LX100. The LX100 is the first Panasonic camera that does not have any of these issues with that type of scenario. They include a diagram in each camera manual that shows what apertures and shutter speeds the program shift function will use. However, the graph for the LX100 is not accurate. It indicates that it will go up to f4.0 and then only make the shutter speed faster instead of reducing the aperture. The camera actually goes up to f5.6 before it stops decreasing the aperture, which is perfect because that is where the lens is sharpest across the whole field of view. This is probably just a mistake in the manual. They may have thought that f4.0 was the sharpest focal ratio when they produced the manual. There are also a few other things that can affect the logic it uses in program priority mode. The shutter type is one of them. The LX100 has a mechanical shutter and a rolling electronic shutter. The mechanical shutter allows shutter speeds from as long as 2 minutes to as fast as 1 4,000th of a second. The electronic shutter will allow 1 second to an astonishingly 1 16 thousandth of a second. Panasonic has claimed that the Micro Four Thirds cameras were capable of 1 16 thousandth of a second before. However, you couldn't ever select that fast of a shutter speed in those cameras. Therefore, the LX100 is the first compact Panasonic camera to actually allow this fast of a shutter speed. There is a new shutter type option in the menu that will allow you to select either the mechanical shutter or the electronic one, or automatically switch between the two. I like to let the camera automatically switch between the two. However, please note that this option can produce unexpected results with program priority mode and auto ISO at the point where it switches from one shutter type to the other. It will sometimes select a slower shutter speed in order to avoid switching to the electronic shutter. That is actually a good thing sometimes because the electronic shutter can have rolling shutter artifacts that don't occur with the mechanical shutter. However, the skewing that occurs with the electronic shutter is much less prevalent than any of the other Panasonic cameras. For the first time, I felt like the rolling shutter effects on a camera were not really an issue at all. You really have to try hard by panning very quickly to make the skewing noticeable. There are many more things I want to discuss, like how to set up the function buttons, custom memory options, and menu settings. 
I also want to discuss the electronic viewfinder and LCD screen. Therefore, I'm going to create several more videos to discuss these topics. Once I have those other videos uploaded, you will see a link to them in this video. You will also be able to find them on my YouTube channel homepage. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have questions, please post them in the comments and I will try to answer them if I can.